What influences teens the most? This part was, this is what I, I think I worry about more than anything because it seems so out of control, out of our own control. Mm -hmm. You're gonna like my answer. Okay. <laughs> The strongest influence, according to Dr. Lisa Damore, may surprise you. We continue our in-depth series on the emotional lives of teenagers with the country's leading expert on adolescence. And then, paying for playdates? I made sure to put all the food her son ate. I counted the number of pumps that they used of soap when he washed his hands. Why one mom takes inventory of everything her little guest eats and uses, and how the other parents feel about reimbursing her. That's today on Mom Squad. Thanks for joining me here on Mom Squad. I'm Maureen Kyle. Hopefully you caught last week's episode where we took a deep dive into teens with their emotions with Dr. Lisa Damore. She is one of the nation's leading adolescent psychologists, the author of three New York Times bestsellers about teen development, and as she revealed to us, Disney's go-to expert to develop Inside Out 2. Lisa was chosen to develop what 13-year-old Riley would be going through and the new emotions that pop up in those early teens teenage years. Our discussion was so insightful, I had to break it up into two episodes. Last week, we talked about what teens experience internally when it comes to brain development, what they're thinking, and how they view the outside world. But we all know that they take a lot of cues from external factors, like friends, social media, even us as parents. Take a listen to my discussion with Dr. Lisa Damore. There are there's a lot going on internally in their brains, but then in your book you also talk about all the external factors that play into how they're developing emotionally. Mm -hmm. This part was, this is what I, I think I worry about more than anything because it seems so out of control, mm -hmm. out of our own control. Mm -hmm. I can control the environment in our house mm -hmm. and I, I can help guide my child but it's those outside influences that really have me worried. Mm -hmm. What are, do you think, the most influential external influences on teens? Hmm. You're gonna like my answer. Okay. <laughs> the single most powerful force for adolescent mental health, strong relationships with caring adults. Oh, okay, well then there we go. So there we yeah. go. <laughs> so yes, teens will have peer influences that make us anxious. They will have influences from the media that make us anxious. Mm -hmm. They will be asked, you know, they are exposed to the world. You can no longer shield teenagers. I measure the health and safety of a teenager by how close their working relationships are with at least one adult in their life. It's wonderful if it's an adult in their own home, but that's not the case for every kid. Mm -hmm. If I know a teenager has a good trusting relationship with at least one adult and can be like, okay, that party was out of control, or I need someone to come get me, yeah. or I saw this thing online and I need to talk about it, I feel really comfortable mm -hmm. that that kid is gonna thrive. It's the kids who don't have those good working relationships, who don't have an adult to check all of that with, or to help keep them safe, or to help talk with them about risky situations and how to manage them well. Those are the kids I worry about. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are worrisome outside influences that are far beyond our control. I mean, this is the natural thing about having a teenager. Mm -hmm. You can't supervise them all the time anymore, yeah. right? I mean, it is scary as a parent or a caregiver. Mm -hmm. But um, I take so much comfort in the fact that the most powerful force is actually the one in our hands. I do like, uh, in part of this book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, you talked about how teens do try to get our our opinion on some of the, like maybe some of the wild things that their friends are doing. Talk to us about that. Like how is it that they're trying to get our opinion on what their friends are doing? It's so interesting. Okay, so here, I've learned this, I mean I've practiced for 30 years with teenagers and just like watch this pattern over the time. Okay, so here's what happens. Say I'm an eighth grader and say that I start to hear that kids in my class are using weed gummies, right? Which is something you can start to hear in the eighth grade. Yeah. I think this is not okay. Nobody else is reacting all that strongly, so now I don't know what to think. So I'm gonna check it with my parents. But I'm gonna run it by them very neutrally because I don't wanna lead the witness, mm -hmm. right? If I come home and I'm like, you're not gonna believe. Right, right. My parents are gonna be like, of course we don't believe. So then I don't know what's real. So I come home and I say, so, I heard that there's some weed gummies being passed around in the eighth grade. Yeah. Okay. Now as the parent, you're like, yeah, this is this can feel Eighth shocking. Yeah. This can feel shocking. <laughs> um, 
let me tell you how I think the ideal response is, and let me tell you how to recover if you've already overreacted. Okay. <laughs> I think the ideal response is to say, what do you think? Because that is just enough for the teenager to know, okay, I'm onto something, like mm -hmm. this is not okay, mm -hmm. like if my parent is asking. And then you can hear what your kid thinks. And if your kid says, this feels not okay or worrisome, you're having the conversation you wanna have. If your kid's like, it's not a big deal at all, <laughs> then you're having a different kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. If you've already overreacted, what? <laughs> yeah. You can go back to your kid and say, you know, when you brought up the weed gummies, caught me off guard, I had a strong reaction, probably not as helpful to you as it could have been. Tell me what you're thinking. Let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it from a safety standpoint. Let's talk about how you're going to take good care of yourself and how I'm going to help you do it. Mm -hmm. For the parent, and we already talked about the annoyance factor, you know, that, that teens are annoyed by w what their parents think sometimes or what they do. So I guess my concern as a parent would be if I say, oh, well, what do you think? Oh, well, I, you know, I don't know if that's right. Mm. I would be afraid I'd push them into, oh, well, mom thinks that that's bad. I'm going to do it. You know, like yep. I know that that's a concern for parents. Absolutely. Is that how the kid's brain is working? Is that how they're thinking of it? Well, it can be. And I think the adult has a lot of control about which road this goes down. So if the adult says, don't let me catch you anywhere near that stuff, teenagers are teenagers. They will hear, don't get caught. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right? <laughs> right? That's not how we want them thinking about it. If the adult says, here's what makes me concerned. Marijuana is hard on the developing adolescent brain. We know this. Mm -hmm. We have research showing this. It can cause lasting harm with repeated use. It makes me worried for those kids. And you, my love, who, you know, your safety means more than anything in the world, mm -hmm. you got one brain for the rest of your life. My, I'm counting on you to take good care of it. Mm -hmm. What I will sometimes say to kids, and I would encourage adults to think about saying to kids, is like, oh, don't worry about getting caught. We're probably not gonna catch you. Mm -hmm. Worry about getting hurt. If you could get hurt, if somebody else could get hurt, that's what to worry about. Now, the benefit of this is safety's neutral, right? It, safety's safety. Yeah. And it goes with your kid everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. If you make it about getting caught, now you're playing a cat and mouse game. If you're making it about staying safe, you have put the onus on your kid to think about it from the standpoint of looking after themselves well. Mm -hmm. So then there's outside influences where mm -hmm. it is the, the mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. which I think is the major concern mm -hmm. for anybody out there mm -hmm. is, okay, well, I, I know how I raised my kid. Mm -hmm. Now they have these friends mm -hmm. that are the influences. Mm -hmm. How do teens' brains process, like, well, this is what how I know I grew up, but my friend's doing this, and if I'm gonna be cool, or if I'm gonna, cool's probably uncool, I'm probably sounding <laughs> like a, n a big nerd. <laughs> but, you know, if I'm gonna mm -hmm. keep up mm -hmm. with my mm -hmm. friends, I'm gonna have to do this. Yep. Is that where their brains go? And then how do you help yep. them to make those good decisions? So, you are right. And this is a thing to be worried about, right? I mean, in the, in the scope of what we worry about with teenagers, um, good kids make dumb decisions, and sometimes their dumb decisions have real and lasting consequences. Mm -hmm. So this is not a baseless concern. Um, here's how we want to think about it. We know that teens especially actually have two kinds of reasoning that they move back and forth between. So one is called cold hot reasoning, and the other is called hot reasoning. So cold reasoning is the good rational thinking they do in the cold light of day. They basically reason like adults. So say it's five o'clock Friday, your kid walks in the house, you're like, what are you doing tonight? And you, the kid's like, I'm going to this party. And yeah. you're like, are you gonna drink at this party? And he's like, no, drinking is not safe. This is not a safe scene. I don't wanna do it. He is telling the truth and he means it. Mm -hmm. Cut to 10 p.m. <laughs> he's at the party. The person he has a crush on is at the party. The person he has a crush on is asks if he wants to drink too. He's like, oh yes, okay. Yeah. This is hot reasoning kicking in. Hot reasoning is informed by exactly what you're describing. Social pressures, emotional charge, wanting to be part of the group. Okay, so this is terrifying, yeah. right? Like yeah. there's two different minds here. So here's how you handle it as a parent. This still doesn't guarantee a kid's safety, but it's a better bet. So back to 5 p.m., the kid says, I am definitely not drinking. Mm -hmm. I know it's not safe, and they mean it. Mm -hmm. And then you say, that's fantastic. What's the plan? for if you get to the party and something changes. There are kids that are drinking, you wanna drink with them. One doesn't seem like a big deal. Like, what's the plan then? And standing there with cold reasoning on your side, you have that conversation. And the kid says, well, maybe, how about can I drive? 
to the party uh -huh. and that gives them an easy out and you're like absolutely you know or you know you can say to your kid do you want us to, do you want to tell your friends that we you know have, will breathalyze you in your sleep, yeah. right? Like, right. do you want to tell your friends you're on a medication? That means you can't use, yeah. you know, anything. Like, let's come up with a game plan that lets you do what your 5 p.m. cold reasoning knows yeah. is the right thing, even at 10 p.m., even under hot conditions. And again, it doesn't guarantee the kid will make the right choice, but it's so much better for them to go into those conditions with a plan mm -hmm as opposed to having to figure out on the fly mm. how to manage it. Mm. Interesting. I want to talk also about with development and and their emotions, something like bullying mm -hmm. or, and tell me if, if there's something else that would really affect their emotional mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. but I can already picture the teens who maybe, you know, they were bullied, so then, then you can just tell that emotionally they have retreated into themselves mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. As a parent, when you start to see those those type of um, influences of the, just the whole social structure mm -hmm. of school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how can you tell if your kid is being affected by that, and then mm -hmm. how do you help them through that? Um, so bullying is something that happens, and it can cause immediate and lasting damage psychologically. Like, we know this. Um, it's not the same as conflict. Conflict is kids not getting along. Mm -hmm. That is the common cold of human interaction all day long. Yeah. Bullying is when a kid is targeted, unable to defend themselves, um, and, and you know, victimized and helpless in the face of it. Um, if you're not sure what you're seeing, you can ask for more information. Mm -hmm. You know, check in with your school, say, here's what I'm hearing, what are you all seeing? Still not sure when to worry? When we come back, Dr. Lisa DeMore shares the signs you should look out for to tell if your teen is being victimized or bullied at school. Welcome back. In case you're just joining us, we've been getting expert insight into your teen's emotional life from Dr. Lisa Damore. In fact, we had so much to discuss. This is part two of our series with her. We talked about what emotional signs to look out for if you suspect your teen is getting bullied at school. Take a listen. For teenagers, mood should be all over the place, mm -hmm. right? They yeah. should be like, it's, so really we should low. expect the roller yes. coaster. Yes. Okay. Really low, and then five minutes later, Taylor and Travis have a new photo online, and yeah. like <laughs> the world is great again. And yeah. then there's bad news: the Cavs lost a game. I mean, like it could be up and down, up and down, yeah. right? That is typical and expectable. If your kid's mood is low, or blank, or wildly cranky mm -hmm. for an extended period. And by extended period, I mean, we could be talking 36 hours. If you know your kid and you're yeah. like, this is not my kid, that is not typical. Mm. So the when to worry is if mood lodges in a concerning place and isn't moving. Mm -hmm. If mood is like this, yeah. we're fine. Wednesday. That's that is, there's nothing special about that. It's so funny that so, we should want that. We yeah, should no, want the roller coaster. That's adolescence. Um, social media, technology. Now this is something we, <laughs> <laughs> we could do, you know, every day, all day on social media, teens, and how mm -hmm. it's influencing. And I just think that um, we can't talk about it enough just because mm -hmm. I didn't grow up with mm -hmm. it. So I won't have a base knowledge of how I handled it at age 12, 13, right. 14 to help guide my kids. So this is wild, wild west here. Um, how does it affect mm -hmm. And we, I know that we can't lump in just technology with social media, so however you need to divide it up, but how, do, how does that as an external influence mm -hmm. um, shape their emotional development? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the truth is it's murky. When we look at the data and we look at broad studies that are well done, we get all of these mixed findings. Mm -hmm. And that's because for any kid, and they will tell you this, social media is simultaneously positive and negative. Mm -hmm. Any kid will tell you this. They love it and they hate it. Yeah. They have a great time. They see things they wish they'd never seen. Like this is all yep. coexisting. So when we go to study it, we get these murky results. Here's how I want adults to use what we know to take good care of kids around social media. So the first thing I would say is delay until at least age 14, at least. Um, and the reason for 14 is that's when kids actually get more skeptical about the world. They start doubting and questioning everything, which is at times annoying at home, but actually really useful online. Um, when you do grant access to technology for your kid, don't let them take it in their bedroom. This rule alone keeps them making better choices, preserves sleep, which we know is incredibly closely connected to yeah. mental health. 
And don't let technology get in the way of the things that we know are healthy for kids to do. Get enough sleep, see their friends, be physically active, help around the house, help around the community, focus in a, you know, when they're studying. We don't want tech crowding those things out. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard to know when a kid's really ready for social media, but one of the things I've started to think about is like, we worry about the risks, right? Social media comes with risks. Yeah. There's no question about it. Teenagers and risks, that's not a new topic. And we can use what we know about thinking through risk to inform decision making here. So I'm increasingly thinking of social media, it's like a high school party. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Kids want to be there and things can go wrong. Yes. Right? That is how yeah. it goes at high school. They want parties. to be there and then they see something where they're like, oh gosh, what did oh, I get myself right? into? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, okay. So, who belongs at high school parties? Not eighth graders. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and for that exact same reason, like you need a certain amount of judgment and caution and skepticism. Okay. Which 14 year olds should go to high school parties? Well, really level headed 14 year olds who will call an adult if something goes wrong. Those kids can probably reasonably be allowed to go to a high school party within reason. There are 17 year olds who should probably not be at high school parties yeah. because they are too impulsive, go find the wrong corner every yeah. time, or aren't gonna use an adult for safety. Yeah. So people know their kids, people know their teenagers. I think neurologically 14 and after is where we should start thinking about social media, but would you send that kid to a high school party? And if the answer is no, they're probably not ready for social media. I love that analogy. That is such a great way to think about it too. Well, and I think it gets to what you said that, yeah, you know, I don't have social media, right? I'm 53 years old, right? Like, I didn't have anything. Yeah. And so we look at it and we're like, oh, this is so foreign, this is so strange. But what if we say, but risks and teenagers aren't new. Mm -hmm. And teenagers wanting something the adults don't want them to have, that's not new either. Yeah. We can bring all of our intuition and all of our experience and all of our reasoning from those things to help us think about social media. Yeah. You have a lot of resources for parents in a lot of different ways. And yes. I think that, that also parents having this knowledge and knowing how to approach it, our emotions and how we handle it, mm -hmm. how much of that is an influence mm -hmm. on how they're developing? Like if, if we're more knowledgeable, mm -hmm. how much of our own Huge. parenting maturity mm -hmm. influences their emotional mm -hmm. development? Um, I believe it's a huge factor. And I think that teenagers can seem mysterious, but they're actually, there's some new things, teenagers are teenagers, there's a lot that we know. So I feel like there's real value in having information and not feeling like you're doing this alone or for the first time. No one, you know, like mm -hmm. no one's ever seen a teenager before. We've seen lots of teenagers. Yeah. So I try to make available all sorts of resources. I have a weekly podcast called Ask Lisa, The Psychology of Parenting. I have this fabulous co-host, Rena Ninen, who's a journalist, and we answer questions every week from parents. Um, and their episodes are short, they're like 30 minutes, and there's 170 of them. So your question has probably been answered somewhere along the way. Yeah. Um, that is available everywhere people listen to podcasts. Um, I have a weekly newsletter that summarizes the points from last week's podcast. It is free. You can sign up for it on my website. And um, so if you don't have time to listen to a podcast, you get the information that way. And my website is just a ton of resources. All of the writing I've done over time for news outlets, new content that I have for families that's videos that they can look at themselves, show their kids. I'm really trying to make it available in a wide variety of ways um, to meet people where they are. Yeah. I mean, we could go on for hours and hours here. <laughs> um, Lisa, thank you so much. I mean, this has been so insightful on, from everything from how their brains are working to how we need to react and how we need to approach everything. Thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you for having me. Sure. Again, a big thank you to Dr. Lisa Damore. When we come back, one mom's hot take is going viral, why she started charging other parents for playdates. We are back and a mom is sparking fierce debate on TikTok for the way she handles her kids' playdates. She started charging parents for things like what their kids ate at her house, sharing screenshots showing the Venmo requests that she sends to parents. She listed out nine items that she had charged for, including snacks, soap, and electricity. I made sure to put all the food her son ate. I counted the number of pumps that they used of soap when he washed his hands. They played video games for 45 minutes, so I calculated how much that electricity cost was and then divided it by two. 
In total, she added up the cost to $36. She texted the other parent about the cash, who was not happy about it. She accused her of price gouging to make money. All right, so I needed to bring in Jenny Jordan on this, our executive producer, my co-host on occasion, to talk about what do we think about this? What was your first reaction? Because you're the one who brought it to my attention. I was shocked. Yeah. <laughs> shocked. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things that maybe you, maybe in my deep, dark mommy brain, I've thought about doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but would never in a million years think to actually, especially to send. Uh, like send a, a Venmo and yes. say, your kid used X amount of pumps of my soap. So you need to reimburse me for that. I think that's much, that's a little much. Plus my initial reaction was, I have guests over. I invite people over all the time. I don't know who initiated what play date, but right. I feel like when you say, come on over my house, you're expecting, I mean, electricity. I, I don't even know what to think of that. Like. You're gonna use the electricity anyway. It's not like how do you know? How do you right. know? I don't how even know. How you? <laughs> yeah. How do you? Is it because this kid doesn't turn off the lights? I don't. I don't, I don't know. know. But like, so that's extreme. The, I feel like the soap is extreme. The snacks. I mean, we've all been there where it's like you end up with all the kids at your house, and all of a sudden, you know, fifty dollars worth of snacks are gone. Right. But I feel like that's just understood when you have guests over. I would never have a dinner date or like invite friends over for dinner and be like, so by the way, that risotto I made, I worked it out, it's $12 each, send me, right. you know what I mean? Right, here's your check, do you here's guys wanna your, split it, yeah, or who's Venmo. doing it? No, it's sort at of your like house. a courtesy, it's a, like a, it's an etiquette thing, right? Well, and I think that's a big part of it. If you feel that you're gonna do that, you need to tell people up front, this mom did not know that it was gonna happen, and she was mad about it. And I thought, yeah, I would be pretty furious. Right. And all of a sudden, your kid's not gonna have too many friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To nobody's gonna want a play date. My question was, and I don't know if any, in any other context she mentioned this, was it like a, hey, can you watch my kid this day? Because I've, oh. I've had other friends say, hey, you know, I'm stuck. Can you watch my kid? You yeah. know, can my, can, Billy come over for a little bit. Right. And then if it's like, oh, fine, but you're gonna pay, you know, I don't know, did it come from I didn't a, see that. I, I didn't see know. that either. And so, sure, of course, you're only getting one part of the story, right? But mm. I mean, she felt it was okay to put out there, so we're okay to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I think that it's sort of an understanding, and you do have to have this, whether it's with your friends or, you know, the neighbor kids, and, you know, we always have kids that are, oh, can I eat dinner with you, or can I eat yeah. dinner? If it, where I'm making pasta, sure. The more the merrier, I have all of it, you know, whatever. Yeah. But if it's a night where we got steaks to put on the grill, and there's just not enough, then yes. I feel bad, and I have to be like, well. Yeah. Sorry kids, you know, or whatever. So there's always that weird line. Um, I always laugh because we have a neighborhood pool, right? And all the kids go to the pool. And we laugh because it's snack city, right? Break time means they get snacks, right? And before, like I got to know my neighbors really well. It's like, oh, here's your little snack, you know? Now it's just bags of chips in the middle of, the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of a blanket and everyone grabs them. And I swear it will be, my kids are always like, oh, I love grapes, bring grapes. I'll bring a whole bag of grapes. They see the other kids' strawberries. It's like, I only want is strawberries. I'm like, mm -hmm. I brought, then the next time I bring strawberries, guess what? Nobody wants to. The other kid has grapes and that's what they want. Yeah, I'm like, right. no, I swear my kids. But so there's sort of a good understanding with my friend group. Mm -hmm. of we don't charge when we ask each other to like, can you watch my kid? Yeah. Because we're gonna trade off back and forth. We don't, we certainly don't charge for snacks. I think I would be broke if my friends yeah. told me <laughs> for all my kids' snacks. Yeah. But I think it is a back and forth, but I could see where it would get really hard if you have a friend that maybe takes advantage of it, mm. or maybe a neighbor who's just like, kind of wild for the summer and they just always end up at your house and you're like, why am I the one always? Right. Because groceries are very expensive. I want, I, oh, I yeah. can understand that. Oh, I, I mean, I, buy what I know we're gonna use too because of right. all the food waste. So if I end up with five extra kids at my house for dinner or snacks or something and then all of a sudden it's like, Ugh. oh wait, I didn't budget enough. I mean, money, food, whatever. Right. But again, I just keep coming back to, like you brought up the point. So you expect one day your kid's gonna be at somebody's house. So, you know, she's, she has a kid over her house 
Well, guess what? Her kid is going to go to somebody else's house. And unless there's like a, hey, here, I'm, you know, I know so-and-so is going to eat. Here's 20 bucks. Like, I, I just, I feel like I want to cover whatever expenses. Right. She better be forthcoming with that. She better be like, here's some cash. Yeah. But I don't know. Or she's sending her kid with their own food to someone's yeah. house. Do they? Do they? Sometimes yeah. I've had that. My friends are like, "Hey, yes. can you watch my kids? I'll send over a bag of chicken nuggets. I have whatever. Right. I don't really need it, but it's a nice gesture, and yeah. I can understand wanting to feel like, sorry, I'm putting you in the, you know, yes. but not ever expected. Never expected. Never. I don't know. We want to know so what buttons. you think too. Um, we're, gonna, we're doing a social version of this, so we want to see what you have to think. Um, right below here, we'll put where you can find us on Facebook and Instagram so that you can also weigh in. Did you ever encounter anything like this? Did you ever feel like you had to reimburse a parent? Or I've even had parents offer, like if, if I've taken the kid out for ice cream, like if we're all going out for ice cream, yeah. I had a mom once that said, how about I Venmo you $5, sorry. And I was like, no, how about you don't? Like yeah. one day you will take my kid out for ice cream. So what have you experienced in your own household with your kids and their friends? Um, do you have a kid who comes over the house and eats all the food? We wanna know. And of right, course- Maybe you have a good tip for it. My one yes. friend does something with, I'm sorry. No, go, <laughs> to get us going. Track. No, no, no. But I, my one works. friend does this um, thing with her and her friends and it's kind of their $5 rule. If it's under $5, I'll never ask you for it. Mm -hmm. So if you pick me up a coffee, it's under $5, maybe I'm not gonna buy it for you. But if it's over $5, like, we went to a fancy restaurant for, yeah. they'll ne they always like, pay and yeah. I was like oh that's kind of a good rule of thumb and it's nice that they talked about it that they had a conversation about it communicate right yeah so yeah maybe other people have that that's what I'm thinking maybe tell us what you do maybe that's a cool way of uh getting around these awkward experiences right oh there's so many awkward experiences to talk about <laughs> future mom squad episodes stay tuned <laughs> so keep the conversation going remember you can catch us on your stream, you can catch us on YouTube, that's the show Mom Squad, and you can catch us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, Jenny, thanks to all of you. We will see you back here next time on Mom Squad.